One of the greatest choices a person can make in their life is the choice to serve their fellow citizens. Maybe it's in government, in the military, or in a police force. In whatever capacity one serves, dedicating your life to making Canada and indeed the world a better place is a calling of the highest order. Now imagine, if you will, being told that the very country you would willingly lay down your life to defend doesn't want you, doesn't accept you, sees you as defective, sees you as a threat to our national security. Not because you can't do the job or because you lack patriotism or courage, no, but because of who you are as a person and because of who your sexual partners are. Now imagine, Mr. Speaker, being subjected to laws, policies, and hiring practices that label you as different, as less than. Imagine having to fight for the basic rights that your peers enjoy over and over again. And imagine being criminalized for who you are. This is the truth for many of the Canadians present in the gallery today, many more listening across the country. This is the devastating story of people who were branded criminals by the government, people who lost their livelihoods and, in some cases, their lives. These aren't distant practices of governments long forgotten. These happened systematically in Canada with a timeline more recent than any of us would like to admit. Mr. Speaker, today we acknowledge an often overlooked part of Canada's history. Today, we finally talk about Canada's role in the systemic oppression, criminalization and violence against the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer and two-spirit communities. And it is my hope that in talking about these injustices, in vowing to never repeat them and acting to right these wrongs, we can begin to heal. Monsieur le Président, aujourd'hui nous reconnaissons une partie souvent négligée de l'histoire de notre pays. Aujourd'hui, nous parlons enfin du rôle qu'a joué le Canada dans l'oppression, la criminalisation et la violence systémique à l'endroit des communautés lesbiennes, gays, bisexuelles, transgenres queer et bispirituel. J'ai espoir qu'en parlant de ces injustices, en promettant qu'elles ne se reproduiront plus jamais et en agissant pour corriger ces erreurs, nous pourrons commencer à guérir ensemble. À leur arrivée sur ce territoire, ceux qui l'ont colonisé ont amené avec eux des normes étrangères quant au bien et au mal au comportement acceptable ou inacceptable, aux partenaires appropriés ou inappropriés. Ils ont amené avec eux des normes de genre rigides, des normes qui se sont manifestées par l'homophobie et la transphobie, des normes qui ont mené à la quasi-destruction des identités LGBTQ et bispirituelles autochtones des gens dont l'identité avait été auparavant vénérée, ont été couverts de honte en raison de la personne qu'ils étaient. Ils ont été rejetés, sujets à la violence. And discrimination against LGBTQ2 communities was quickly codified in criminal offenses like buggery, gross indecency, and body house provisions. Bathhouses were raided, people were entrapped by police. Our laws bolstered and emboldened those who wanted to attack non-conforming sexual desire. Our laws made private and consensual sex between same-sex partners a criminal offense, leading to the unjust arrest, conviction and imprisonment 
of Canadians. This criminalization would have lasting impacts for things like employment, volunteering, and travel. Those arrested and charged were purposefully and vindictively shamed. Their names appeared in newspapers in order to humiliate them and their families. Lives were destroyed, and tragically, lives were lost. Ces pratiques n'ont pas pris fin en 1969, lorsque les relations homosexuelles ont été en partie décriminalisées. Jusqu'en 1988, un homme gay de 20 ans qui avait des relations sexuelles avec un autre homme risquait encore d'être condamné pour ce qu'on considérait encore un crime. Mais il n'y avait pas que l'emprisonnement et la criminalisation des personnes LGBTQ2. D'autres moyens d'oppression ont été utilisés dans notre société, et ce, depuis des générations. L'homophobie, à l'époque de la crise du sida, a provoqué l'hystérie et propagé une peur des hommes gays. Des livres et des magazines étaient interceptés à la frontière sous prétexte d'infractions d'obscénité et de réglementations douanières le contenu de textes et d'images étant jugé inacceptable. Des familles LGBTQ2 ont dû se battre contre leur propre gouvernement pour avoir droit à des avantages sociaux et à la liberté de se marier, souvent à un prix personnel élevé. Over our history, laws, policies enacted by the government led to the legitimization of much more than inequality. They legitimized hatred and violence and brought shame to those targeted. While we may view modern Canada as a forward-thinking, progressive nation, we can't forget our past. The state orchestrated a culture of stigma and fear around LGBTQ2 communities, and in doing so, destroyed people's lives. Mr. Speaker, a purge that lasted decades will forever remain a tragic act of discrimination suffered by Canadian citizens at the hands of their own government. From the 1950s to the early 1990s, the Government of Canada exercised its authority in a cruel and unjust manner undertaking a campaign of oppression against members and suspected members of the LGBTQ2 community. The goal was to identify these workers throughout the public service, including the Foreign Service, the military, and the RCMP, and persecute them. You see, the thinking of the day was that all non-heterosexual Canadians would automatically be at increased risk of blackmail by our adversaries due to what was called character weakness. This thinking was prejudiced and flawed. And sadly, what resulted was nothing short of a witch hunt. The public service, the military, and the RCMP spied on their own people inside and outside of workplaces. During this time, the federal government even dedicated funding to an absurd device known as the fruit machine, a failed technology that was supposed to measure homosexual attraction. Canadians were monitored for anything that could be construed as homosexual behavior, with community groups, bars, parks, and even people's homes under constant watch. When the government felt that enough evidence had accumulated, some suspects were taken to secret locations in the dark of night to be interrogated. They were asked invasive questions about their relationships and sexual preferences. Hooked up to polygraph machines, these law-abiding public servants had the most intimate details of their lives cut open. Women and men were abused by their superiors, 
and asked demeaning, probing questions about their sex lives. Some were sexually assaulted. Those who admitted they were gay were fired, discharged, or intimidated into resignation. They lost dignity, lost careers, and had their dreams and indeed their lives shattered. Nombreux ont été ceux qu'on a soumis à du, soumis à du chantage pour qu'ils dénoncent leur père qu'on a obligé à trahir leurs amis, leurs amis et leurs collègues. Certains ont promis de mettre fin à leur relation s'ils pouvaient garder leur emploi. Poussés à se cacher encore plus, ils ont perdu leurs partenaires, leurs amis et leur dignité. Ceux qui ne perdaient pas leur emploi étaient rétrogradés. Leur code de sécurité était révoqué. Ils n'ont pas été considérés pour des promotions qu'ils méritaient. Under the harsh glare of the spotlight, people were forced to make an impossible choice, their career or their identity. And the very thing Canadian officials feared, blackmail of LGBTQ2 employees was happening. But it wasn't at the hand of our adversaries. It was at the hands of our own government. Mr. Speaker, the number one job of any government is to keep its citizens safe. And on this, we have failed LGBTQ2 communities and individuals time and time again. It is with shame and sorrow and deep regret for the things we have done that I stand here today and say we were wrong, we apologize, I am sorry, we are sorry. state-sponsored systemic oppression and rejection, we are sorry. For suppressing two-spirit indigenous values and beliefs, we are sorry. For abusing the power of the law and making criminals of citizens, we are sorry. For the censure of the government and the tentatives successives visant à vous empêcher de bâtir vos communautés, pour vous avoir refusé l'égalité et vous avoir forcé à lutter constamment pour cette égalité, et ce, souvent à un coût élevé, pour vous avoir forcé à vivre à l'écart, pour vous avoir rendu invisible et vous avoir humilié, nous sommes profondément désolés. Nous avions tort. To all the LGBTQ2 people across this country who we have harmed in countless ways, we are sorry. To those who were left broken by a prejudiced system and to those who took their own lives, we have failed you. For stripping you of your dignity, for robbing you of your potential, for treating you like you were dangerous 
indecent and flawed. We are sorry. To the victims of the purge who were surveilled, interrogated, and abused, who were forced to turn on their friends and colleagues who lost wages, lost health, and lost loved ones, we betrayed you, and we are so sorry. To those who were fired, to those who resigned, to those who stayed at a great personal and professional cost, to those who wanted to serve but never got the chance because of who you are. You should have been permitted to serve your country, and you were stripped of that option. We are sorry. We were wrong. Indeed, all Canadians missed out on important contributions you could have, would have made to our society. You were not bad soldiers, sailors, airmen and women. You were not predators, and you were not criminals. You served your country with integrity and courage. You are professionals. You are patriots. And above all, you are innocent. For all your suffering, you deserve justice, and you deserve peace. It is our collective shame that you were so mistreated. And it is our collective shame that this apology took so long. Many who suffered are no longer alive to hear these words, and for that, we are truly sorry. To the partners, families, and friends of the people we harmed for upending your lives and for causing you such irreparable pain and grief, we are sorry. En présentant ces excuses pour nos erreurs douloureuses, nous devons aussi remercier ceux qui ont fait entendre leur voix, aux gens qui ont résisté lorsque c'était impopulaire et même dangereux de la faire. À des gens de partout au pays, de tous les horizons et de toutes les allégeances politiques, nous vous exprimons notre admiration pour votre courage et nous vous remercions. We also thank members of the We Demand an Apology Network, our LGBTQ2 Apology Advisory Council, and the Just Society Committee for EGAL as well as the individuals who have long advocated for this overdue apology. Grâce à eux, nous avons compris que nous ne pouvions pas tout simplement oublier ce chapitre de notre histoire. On ne rendrait service ni à la communauté ni à l'ensemble des Canadiens en effaçant cette triste histoire. Nous allons travailler avec le milieu universitaire et les intervenants pour veiller à ce que cette histoire soit connue et accessible au grand public. We must remember and we will remember. We will honor and memorialize the legacy of those who fought before us in the face of unbearable hatred and danger. Mr. Speaker, it is my hope that we will look back on today as a turning point, but there is still much more work to do ahead of us. Discrimination against LGBTQ2 communities is not a moment in time, but an ongoing centuries-old campaign. We want to be a partner and ally to LGBTQ2 Canadians in the years going forward. There are still real struggles facing these communities, including for those who are intersex, queer people of color, and others who suffer from intersectional discrimination. Transgender Canadians 
are subjected to discrimination, violence, and aggression at alarming rates. In fact, trans people didn't even have explicit protection under federal human rights legislation until this year. Les problèmes de santé mentale et les suicides sont plus fréquents chez les jeunes des communautés LGBTQ2 à cause de la discrimination et du harcèlement dont ils sont victimes et le taux d'itinérance parmi ces jeunes est stupéfiant. Il reste du travail à faire au niveau des dons de sang et d'organes et de la criminalisation de la non-divulgation du VIH. Le gouvernement doit continuer à travailler avec ses partenaires pour améliorer les politiques et les programmes. Cela dit, des changements importants et significatifs sont en vue. L'abrogation de l'article 159 du Code criminel fait son chemin à la Chambre des communes. And Mr. Speaker, I am proud to say that earlier today in this House, we tabled the Expungement of Historically Unjust Convictions Act. This will mean that Canadians previously convicted of consensual sexual activity with same-sex partners will have their criminal records permanently destroyed. Further, I am pleased to announce that over the course of the weekend, we reached an agreement in principle with those involved in the class action lawsuit for actions related to the purge. Never again Will Canada's government be the source of so much pain for members of the LGBTQ2 communities? We promise to consult and work with individuals and communities to right these wrongs and begin to rebuild trust. We will ensure that there are systems in place so that these kinds of hateful practices are a thing of the past. Discrimination and oppression of LGBTQ2 Canadians will not be tolerated anymore. Grâce au dialogue et à une meilleure compréhension de l'autre, nous irons de l'avant ensemble. Mais nous n'y arriverons pas seuls. Pour transformer les cœurs et les mentalités, il faut un effort collectif. Nous devons travailler ensemble dans tous les paliers de gouvernement avec les communautés LGBTQ2 et les peuples autochtones pour réaliser les progrès importants que les Canadiens LGBTQ2 méritent. Mr. Speaker, Canada's history is far from perfect. But we believe in acknowledging and righting past wrongs so that we can learn from them. For all our differences, for all our diversity, we can find love and support in our common humanity. We're Canadians, and we want the very best for each other, regardless of our sexual orientation or our gender, identity, or expression. We will support one another in our fight for equality, and Canada will stand tall on the international stage as we proudly advocate for equal rights for LGBTQ2 communities around the world. <laughs> to the kids, who are listening at home and who fear rejection because of their sexual orientation or their gender identity and expression, and to those who are nervous and scared but also excited about what their future might hold. We are all worthy of love and deserving of respect. And whether you discover your truth at six, at 16, 
or at 60. Who you are is valid. To members of the LGBTQ2 communities, young and old, here in Canada and around the world, you are loved and we support you. Le Canada, le Canada devient un peu plus fort chaque fois que nous choisissons d'accueillir et de célébrer qui nous sommes dans toute notre particularité. Nous sommes un pays de diversité. Nous sommes un pays plus riche grâce aux vies, aux expériences et aux contributions de personnes gays, lesbiennes, bisexuelles, transgenres, queer et bispirituelles. To the trailblazers who have lived and struggled, and to those who have fought so hard to get us to this place, thank you for your courage and thank you for lending your voices. I hope and I know that you look back on all you have done with pride. It is because of your courage that we are here today, together, reminding ourselves and each other that we can and must do better. For the oppression of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer and two-spirit communities, we apologize. On behalf of the government, parliament and the people of Canada, we were wrong, we are sorry, we will never let this happen again. Merci, Mr. Mr.